So to get into the, the core of our program, I'd like to introduce Dustin Hassler, who's the Chief Innovation Officer at eRepublic. Um, he's done a, a, a lot of work in how uh, public sectors can use uh, in innovative technology. So with no further ado, let me introduce Dustin. Thank you. Thanks. Good morning. It's great to, uh, great to be here. I knew I was in LA when I opened Waze and it told me good luck when I landed. <laughs> so <laughs> it's the only place I can go that it said, you know, an hour and 30 minutes to go about nine miles. So I was like, all right, I'm in LA. So, but uh, great to be here. Um, my background is state and local government. I was a CIO and assistant city manager for a suburb of Austin, Texas for five years. Did a lot of crazy things with technology while I was there. We introduced some of the first crowdsourcing technologies in government at the time and then uh, went on and started doing this with cities all over the world. So, uh, so great to be here. What I want to do for my remarks is talk about some of the macro trends that are really impacting government with technology. And so IoT is an important part of that, but I want to dive in a little bit deeper to show you some of the things that we're tracking on and how the public sector is responding to it. There's a very interesting moment in time that public servants are in as I stand here today. And so we're going to dive into a lot of that and uh, have a little fun as we do it. So we'll look at what's going on today. We'll talk about what's next. We'll talk about what it means for you. And then the questions and answers, I defer to my colleague, uh, <laughs> Mike. No, we'll, uh, we'll do that. So as I mentioned, IoT is all the rage right now in the public sector. There are agencies like the city of Las Vegas that are doing amazing work when it comes to the Internet of Things and really the Internet of Everything. And we do surveys on a regular basis just to understand and to kind of do a pulse check of city leaders and how they're approaching some of these new emerging technologies. And you might think government is kind of standing on the fence and not doing anything, but they're planning with, the I, with IoT in mind. We saw 81% of city leaders say that this is an important aspect of how they do comprehensive planning, not just IT strategic plans, but going well beyond you know, how they actually deliver services. And so this is a very important topic, but it's one piece of a much bigger dynamic that's taking place in society that we're seeing manifested through a lot of different things. So when you look inside and kind of under the hood of government, traditionally the CIO is kind of the, the person that's architecting and directing these things. And so one of the other things that we do is we look at what they're thinking, what's on their mind, what are their top priorities. And so from a city standpoint, not surprisingly, cybersecurity is number one. This is the most important thing from a technology standpoint that city CIOs are looking at. It's often the most unfunded mandate though in government because the CIOs have to try to convince councils to outlay capital for cybersecurity when there's not a storm brewing. So we'll see some changes with that. We have citizen experience. So this renewed focus on how do I design services around people? So things like design thinking are starting to work their way into local government. Mobility, you know, you've got employees that expect to be able to access and, and do their work from wherever. Uh, and you have the same expectations now in the consumer side. So citizens also expect, in fact, Accenture did a study that said 85% of consumers actually expect if not the same, better service delivery with government. So crazy times that we're in. When you go to county, again, cybersecurity, top priority. Staffing is another major issue. How do I hire and retain individuals that can deal with a lot of these new technologies? And, and how do I actually leverage them? Mobility, transparency is really key, disaster recovery, and again, you'll see experience. Uh, IoT is an important part of that. Uh, from a state standpoint, cybersecurity, right? You'll see the thread here. Shared services, cloud computing, all of these new interesting dynamics are working their way in. Um, and again, you know, it's, a, it's an exciting time to be in government because if you were to look at these priorities just a few years ago, there's a lot of things that wouldn't be on this list. So IT modernization is huge. Now, when you think about how government traditionally grapples with change, they do one of two things. They either create an acronym or they create a title to manage an acronym. So <laughs> we've been tracking new C-level positions in state and local government for the past five years, and there's now 30 new C-level positions in counting including chief smart cities officers, there's chief sustainability officers. So government is trying to grapple with change by putting people in charge of that. And so this is actually an encouraging thing. Now it doesn't mean that we want to create silos of positions, but it's encouraging to see government try to make sense of some of these new interesting technologies that are out there. We've seen some cities actually start to plan for what happens when you have a CISO that is not human, that's actually you know, an AI or software defined role. So government is starting to think about these things and figure out how they're going to manage them. So when we started looking at some of these trends, I wanted to understand what was actually influencing them. So what are some of the external trends that are causing change right now in society and that are hitting state and local government agencies like crazy? First one's hyperconnectivity, right? 
When, what's the first thing your kids ask for if you go into a restaurant? My kids, first thing they ask for, they're super shy, what's the Wi-Fi password? They won't order a drink or food, but they'll ask the waitress for the Wi-Fi password. So there's 7.53 billion people on Earth, 8.7 billion internet-connected devices, and we're starting to see this really exponentially grow. You know, it's estimated within the next two to three years we'll hit 50 billion devices. Some of the, the hottest new connected devices are actually vehicles. You'll hear more about you know, what Vegas is doing with that. But very interesting time to be around when it comes to connectivity. Now the second thing, critical mass. People are actually leveraging available connectivity to do things. So we now have you know, the ability to access the internet from anywhere and people are taking advantage of it. So worldwide, 41% of the earth is connected. But you're seeing a lot of innovation from private sector companies to try to bridge that through CubeSats, through SpaceX, uh, and, uh, and drone technology. In the US, 87% of the United States is connected. You'll see a lot of different stats on this that vary. It depends on what you define as connectivity, because is a smartphone considered home broadband access? So a lot of kind of debate happening right now with the FCC on this definition. But people have access, and people are using this technology to do things, which brings us to the most disruptive aspect that is impacting government. And that's how we consume the internet has changed. We don't just consume it, we create it. Every 60 seconds, we're adding vast amounts of information back to the internet. When I first learned HTML, you know, there was a significant barrier in a book about this thick that I had to read in order to know how to interface with this new technology. Today, you don't have to have that. People can create new experiences online without having to know any programming, without needing to know a language. And they're doing all kinds of really interesting things that we'll dive into today. But the most important thing is that everything is exponentially changing. So when we started looking at the speed of change, it is accelerating and it's starting to impact the public sector. So when you think about going to a normal government agency, we used to have to go in person and fill out a long form, high degree of effort, very little degree of impact, right? Then it went, was processed by the agency, services were turned on. Then agencies started to automate the back end. So now my services got turned on a little bit faster as I filled out that same long form. Then we put that long form online and we said we don't have to see you. You can fill out the same long form online. Good luck. And, uh, and we rendered services. And then a lot of agencies went mobile. In fact, I heard you know, mobile first is, is a, lot of, uh, a lot of the philosophy that we have now in government. The challenge, our people, we as consumers, are no longer there. We're in this new category. We expect experiences to be built on predictive technology. When you go to Amazon.com, you see information, you see an experience designed around you, your own behavior, your own data graph, your own interest graph. When you go to a government website, what do you see? You see every possible user interaction flow available. Whether you're a business, whether you're a consumer, it doesn't matter, everything is at your disposal. But that's changing. People are expecting government to meet them where they're at and build experiences around them. So that's one trend. The second trend is it used to take a lot of capital and a lot of time to raise capital in order to bring new technology to market. The typical Fortune 500 company took 20 years to reach a billion dollars in market cap. That's now changed as well. You can have a great idea that can hit a billion dollars in valuation, sometimes in a scary way, in under a year, which is accelerating the pace of change when it comes to how technology is funded and new technology that comes to market, which leads us to this next change. Adoption has changed. As everything becomes software defined, it doesn't take as much time to adopt and change behavior around new technology. It took electricity 46 years to reach a quarter of the American population. We follow this down, telephone 35 years, radio 31 years, television 26 years, the PC 16 years, mobile phones 13 years, the web 7 years, Pokemon Go 2 months, right? <laughs> so not saying that that is what government is doing, but as things become software defined, the adoption cycle are accelerating. So no longer can you be a CIO and wait to see what happens in the private sector and then react to that. You have to be quicker than ever being in the public sector, which makes the need for industry to be a valuable partner here even more important. So what does this mean for us? Everything's getting quicker and it's having more impact. Technology is accelerating change in the ability for people to do all kinds of crazy things. So let's look a little bit inside of government to some of these key trends that are happening. I'll talk about how technology is impacting work intelligence and sharing. You ready? All right, you need more coffee? <laughs> All right, crowdsourcing. So as you know, crowd, any group of people, and sourcing, the distribution of work. So crowdsourcing, made famous by sites like Wikipedia. You know, an example of active crowdsourcing. People know they're consciously participating in a crowdsourced system. 
You know, when you think about the amazing things about these technologies, there was another system out there called Encarta that was trying to do the same thing with the access to the best experts, images, and talent and funding. And we saw which one won. The collective power of people overruled that. In government, we're seeing that being used and manifested through a variety of different names. This is an application called C-Click Fix. It was founded by Ben Berkowitz and a group of uh, his friends in New Haven, Connecticut. And this actually started with a problem. They were trying to get graffiti taken care of. And they were frustrated that the city wasn't doing anything about it, so they built technology to bother the city. So they could go around and report problems, and it would nudge council members and send them emails and send the mayor email. And then they realized, hey, this is actually pretty good infrastructure that we could sell to government. So now many cities use C-Click Fix as an aspect of their 311 system. You take a picture of a problem, geotags a problem, sends all the metadata to the government agency, and the agency can respond and fix that and have a dialogue with people. Again, a group of individuals that experienced an issue, they didn't go to a council meeting and speak. They built something. They built something to change the paradigm. We also have passive crowdsourcing, slightly scarier version. You know, we, we've seen these CAPTCHAs forever, and this may not be new to many of you, but you know, we solve 200, of the, 200 million of these every single day, 150,000 man hours worth of translation. Do a lot of work for, uh, for uh, recaption Google. Uh, but we've seen passive crowdsourcing enter new paradigms with applications like Waze. So you know, we are all pal passive crowdsource sensors for Waze. We may not realize as many agencies are now partnering directly with Waze to grab access to that data, to trade data with Waze, in order to better plan and implement transportation systems. And so we're starting to look at how do we leverage sensors that are already out in field and use them to better manage our cities. And so Waze is an example of that that's been going crazy in government. We've also seen really interesting use cases of cell phone technology, US Geological Survey is using cell phones to actually determine and anticipate earthquakes that are happening before the shock wave is felt by people. So they can get about a seven second heads up before you feel the P wave of an earthquake by tracing cell phones collectively plotted and, uh, and looking for movement. So interesting stuff, but again, fueled by the government. The government is using technology to redefine the way that work is done. From an intelligence standpoint, we've seen the rise of open data. Open data in government has become ubiquitous. You can go online and you can find open data portals and the data exhaust from cities like crazy. We're kind of reaching this point where now we have to standardize and normalize the data that agencies have. So as we have 90,000 plus government agencies that exist in the, in the country, we've got 19,000 cities alone. Does it make sense to have 19,000 open data portals? No. So we have to find ways to try to connect the dots, but it's encouraging to see that agencies are focusing on taking the data that they have and making it accessible to individuals, to companies, to developers, to build things and to create better experiences. We've seen participatory budgeting as kind of one of those, where in the city of New York, you can actually go, there's discretionary budget funds that are set up, and if you live in some of these districts, you can go and actually allocate how you want to do these projects, and how you want them funded. So we're finding ways to engage people where they're at. We've also seen the rise of open checkbooks. So taking financial data, which is the most public uh, requested data there is, it's normally public safety data, or financial data, typically employees and how much they make uh, by their coworkers, right? Uh, so we're seeing that data also opened up so that people can access it and visualize it. And this is an example, this is a screenshot from a company called ClearGov that basically takes that data and provides a layer of context for people to understand, is it good or bad, right? If you tell someone that your city's budget is $50 billion and that they spend X amount on IT, no one knows if that's good or bad. How does that compare to other cities of similar size per capita? So companies are taking that information and they're building new experiences and monetizing it around the public sector. And then we have the oversized Campbell soup can, right? We've got this, these new paradigms that are coming in and changing the way that we interact with technology as well. And agencies are also embracing that. They're finding ways to build new skill sets on it. States are allowing you, the state of Mississippi, you can ask when you need to renew your hunting license to your Amazon Echo. Right? We've got Google Home that's coming to the mix. It's allowing you to ask questions, which is getting us to this interesting point of being able to query information without having a specific application installed. So sharing today. When you think about the sharing economy, we always think about the disruptions that Uber and Lyft and all of these different entities cause. Well, there's agencies and there's technologies that have been built around sharing what government has. Right? We all love backhoes, but many backhoes in cities are underutilized and just sit in a yard unless they're being used for a specific purpose. So they just sit there depreciating. What if you applied the effects of Airbnb and Uber to that? And so a company called MuniRent did that. You could actually rent out your backhoe that a city owns to another city, 
so that they can use it and you can gain value from that underutilized asset. So agencies are getting very creative with how they maximize the infrastructure that they have. We've seen open innovation models also work their way into government. This is a federal example of something called challenge.gov, where they realized it's cheaper to actually put out a challenge for a specific problem that you need solved and have people compete to solve it for prize money than a procurement process would cost. So they're putting things online and they're hacking procurement processes by allowing people to tap into these open systems and participate. Another fun example, real, real example, I was uh, in San Francisco, there were people beating drums outside of City Hall protesting something, and I asked the guy that had the drum and was beating it what he was protesting. He said he didn't know he'd been hired to be there till five. <laughs> I was like, okay, that's interesting. Uh, how were you hired? <laughs> and so people are now available. When you think about the sharing economy, you can tap the excess capacity of your house, the room in your house, your boat, a drone, and now your time, people. So you can use it for birthday parties or you can use it to protest and picket city halls. But this is a weapon now being used against government to elevate perceived problems with things. You know, I've seen it used with plastic bag bans and people want to rebel against that and they don't want that in place. Just hire a group of people to picket city hall and it makes it look like a much bigger issue than it really is. This is the world that we're in. Which has kind of led us to this really interesting point, as Tom Goodwin says, where you know, the world's largest taxi company, Uber, doesn't own any vehicles. Most popular media owner, Facebook, creates no content. Alibaba, the most valuable re retailer, has no inventory. And Airbnb, the world's largest accommodation provider, doesn't own any real estate. And so these are all creating these interesting paradigms for us to navigate as society. But government is moving and they're doing things and they're taking advantage of a lot of these new technologies. We've seen the city of San Francisco testing algorithms to actually suggest, not actually set, but suggest bail amounts for defendants. So using technology to try to aid in some of these really complex processes. It's been funny to see some of the rollouts of self-driving cars. You know, when these started rolling out, government agencies fought it just like Uber. They didn't want it, but now they're competing for it. They want to be test beds. They want to be the home of emerging technologies. And so agencies across the country are fighting to try to bring those in. We've seen technology used for economic development. City of Long Beach, California, is trying to streamline the economic development process using technology so that they can open up data. You want to put a coffee shop on that corner? Is it a good or bad idea? What if we could actually tell citizens that as they were filling out the permit application? What if we could bring some of this underutilized data that we have to the table for them to find out? And then we've seen hacking procurement. Procurement and government sucks. It's very complex. If you've interfaced with government, it's very challenging. There's a lot of nuances to how you do it. So some large cities have started finding ways to hack that process. And so San Francisco created something called Startups in Residence. They invite startups to come in for uh, specific purposes for 16 weeks unpaid and to test their technology. If it works, it may go to a, a sole source procurement opportunity for that company. And this has grown and it's now nationwide. In fact, their first international city will come on next year. So hacking procurement using technology as a vehicle. Favorite example? comes down to partnering with what was once the perceived enemy. People don't normally show up for jury duty, which is kind of expensive for government agencies to process. You gotta do fail to appear, you gotta go after them, they get mad, it just leaves a bad taste in their mouth. What if government paid for Uber to pick you up and take you to jury duty? Would you show up? People are, right? So in Macomb County, Michigan, they're using Uber, saving money, and creating a better experience by leveraging a third party transit. We're also seeing a lot of experimentation with new technologies, chatbots all over the place. We've seen the city of LA, in fact, LA deputized a chatbot named, named Chip that will respond to prospective police officers and any questions they have that they wouldn't normally ask a person. They have that, it's also part of their business development network, so a lot of great things. And the biggest thing is a lot of companies are now focusing on government as an industry. And so they're finding ways to incubate and test technology, like what Google is doing with Sidewalk Labs in Toronto. This is something that is becoming increasingly important because government is an industry of industries. And so many of you that may not be operating in this space may not realize that state and local government alone, we're not talking about the feds, state and local government spends $103 billion a year on information technology and services. It's a lot of money. It actually is a lot larger than the federal IT spend when it comes down to it. So that's what's happening today in government. But I want to give you a little taste of what's coming around the corner. So we'll stick to those same three buckets. We'll talk about work tomorrow. So agencies are facing a lot of challenges with the workforce and how technology comes in and, and plays with this. And one of the greatest indications of how work is changing in the public sector 
can be seen with freelancing. So people that drive for Uber, that have monetized their excess capacity through Upwork and have found different ways to actually create monetary value with their excess time. 53 million Americans, about 34% of the workforce, is doing that today. Now, the estimation is that within the next two years, 50% of the American workforce will be doing this to some degree. It doesn't mean that they're going to all give up on their eight to five jobs and suddenly become freelancers, but we're reaching this point in time where some of the largest employers in the country are not your traditional Fortune 100 companies. The rise of these human staffing firms that are actually providing a set of benefits that are portable to agencies is coming. And this is one way that government is trying to solve this paradigm. How do I bridge the gap of not having a CISO in 19,000 cities? Well, maybe I hire one on demand. Maybe I have one on retainer. So a lot of different work that's happening here. We see the future of the workforce being distributed. So you can have agencies that have hybrid workforces, some that work for them, some that don't work for them, but that are on demand and that have the skill sets necessary to solve problems. It's going to be decentralized, which sounds crazy in government, but States have started launching holacracy in IT. We've started to see new methodologies that have worked their way into organizational management and government that you would never imagine that are actually being quite successful. That's going to be engaged because if you ever hired a freelancer, if they don't do a good job, you separate, right? If they don't like you, they can leave. If you don't like them, you can leave. So what happens when your workforce has that same dynamic? It's going to change the nature of work. We also have the, the rise of automation. I thought this was an interesting stat you might like. This came from the Bureau of Labor and Statistics. If you make less than $20 an hour, there's an 83% chance your job will be replaced by technology. If you make $20 to $40 an hour, there's a 31% chance. If you make more than $40 an hour, there's a 4% chance, and you can buy me a drink after I'm done. But um, <laughs> we're in this new dynamic of what happens when positions become software defined, and you know, how does this play out? Lots of different theories on it. But in agencies, you're going to see a lot of back-end positions that are automated and the need for retooling, reskilling, and transitioning. You know, civil service is, is going to be a challenge and something that agencies are starting to deal with today. So let's talk about intelligence tomorrow. We see government really being an API, right? Does it make sense for each government agency that exists in the country to have their own mobile app? No. In fact, I advise significantly against that. In the future, you'll be able to ask, depending on where you're at, a question and there will be a skill in an API that's established for that agency that you don't have to go chase down and find, but that your systems will connect to. And so this is actually kind of where we see mobile going. It's more about APIs and being able to take, you know, a single point of interaction, whether it's an assistant that's through your voice or whether it's a text-based assistant or a combination of the two that taps into the right API to solve that problem based on the context that you provide it. We also see the rise of people being more valuable than they are today. So when you think about citizen engagement, right, how much value do agencies get out of you liking their stuff on Twitter or Facebook, right? It's helpful, but do you think the smiley faces and the reactions are going to counsel and being used to make informed decisions? No. So you're going to see new mechanisms of engagement. This is a screenshot from one of my cell phones that just shows you the amount of available horsepower that's there to use people as sensors that opt into being sensors for government. You're going to see new layers of autonomous transit. So we've seen this life-saving drone actually save someone's life now, not in the U.S., but overseas. And we're going to see more infrastructure that disrupts government's ability to regulate. When Tesla rolled out the Model S, it had the capability of being self-driving, but it wasn't activated until an over-the-air software update gave it life. Could government stop it? No, because now we can enact hardware changes, physical changes to what's already in place by enabling new updates that don't require you to go in and do things. We've seen this also work its way into the public sector. We've got self-driving garbage trucks that are being tested. The feds have said Google self-driving AI can be a driver in all 50 states unless the states have rebelled against it, which is kind of leading us to this point of this exponential change also creates exponential risk. We've got a new cybersecurity landscape where, as we've seen in Atlanta, there's now exponentially increasing cybersecurity risk and incidents that happen. But it's also, this is a great graphic from Bell Labs, correlated to the total payout and billions of dollars for the liability incurred there. So that's why 60% of cities today have cyber insurance, because they can't understand how to architect and defend against this, and they know that it's inevitable that you know, these things are going to start to create more liability for government. And it's going to start to create more problems. Like this was a famous wired piece about hacking a Jeep. Someone steals your identity today, what do you do? You go to the local police department, they know exactly how to handle that. Someone hacks into your Jeep and crashes it into a ditch, what do you do? 
You go to the local police department. What do they do? I don't know, right? So these are new challenges that are going to have local government impact because local government is what touches people. Sharing, a lot of changes here. I was on a flight, I'll let you guess the airline, had a bad experience, so built an app from my browser, 40,000 feet in the air, without a single line of code through MIT's App Inventor. And every time you hit that button, it would send a randomized, angry tweet that I pre-wrote um, to said airline. So <laughs> this is what people have access to. So if they're frustrated, are they gonna go to a council meeting and sign up to speak? No, they're gonna build technology to disrupt the way that you do business or to angry tweet you. We're seeing this renewed emphasis on using people to also create a layer of transparency. Taser, which is now Axon, wants to build an army of people that can use their cell phones as evidence capture outside of agencies. So a lot of innovation happening here. And then we have the blockchain because you can't go to something without a blockchain reference. But government agencies are doing a lot with the blockchain and they're piloting it, they're trying to figure it out, they're trying to understand it. A lot of different innovations and, and technologies that are starting to come into the mix here. Ultimately, the blockchain and government will have to be ushered in through platform companies to provide the infrastructure and the network requirements capable in order to do this. We can go into that more later. But one of the most encouraging things is that this industry is blossoming and exploding. We see the rise of what we call the GovTech industry, which are companies that are exclusively focused on government as a customer. And so it's creating all kinds of new opportunities, new technology. I was with a company called Biobot Analytics in Austin at South by Southwest a few weeks ago, and they developed a sensor that can actually analyze digested metabolites in sewage to determine what opioids were actually specifically being used within a particular area. So you could tailor your strategies for reducing uh, those types of opioids. So a lot of really crazy technology, hardware, software, you name it, government is a customer. So how does government keep up? Well, we think agencies have to operate exponentially. Agencies need to look at exponential frameworks and think exponentially, plan exponentially, and be exponential. So the way that we do that is we look at cities in, in the case of three layers. You get an infrastructure layer, you get a people layer, and even intelligence layer. And so we'll start with some of the key dynamics that need to be in place in order for agencies to be exponential. Scalable infrastructure, IoT devices, open data, and data standards. So scalable infrastructure. You have to create a platform where your infrastructure can gain additional capability, can be a platform for new things that you can't predict today. Many cities are looking at the light pole as that where I can use this as a basis to start to gain greater situational awareness about my community and what I can do with it. Um, leverage connected devices. IoT isn't about just overlaying sensors all over your city and magic happens. It's also about leveraging what's already out there. Most cities don't have the capital necessary in order to actually fully implement the realized vision of the Internet of Things. So they're gonna have to leverage where there's already sensors. And so people are gonna be an important vehicle for that. Open data is also key but we have to normalize and start to standardize the data that we have. The LCRA in Austin takes all of their flood sensor data and they put it online. And so people have built different apps that do everything from predicting when a, a low water crossing is gonna be flooded to micro or hyper local weather forecasting, all using open data that's collected by this special district. Data standards will be even more important. Open data is ubiquitous, but it actually isn't valuable unless you have context to know whether or not something's good or bad. And if every city's storing data differently, how am I gonna actually know whether my city's doing a good job? So this will be important. DLDS is a standard that was created to try to standardize building data, an open standard that anyone can use uh, as an example of that in action. People. Agencies are gonna have to look at crowdsourced work and microtasking, on-demand hybrid labor forces, and adaptive organizational structures. Crowdsource work. There's so many available talent pools that are out there that can be tapped into to solve specific needs at specific times for agencies. So you're gonna see a lot more of this work its way. In fact, we predict and anticipate that government-focused special pools of talent will be created in the near future. But you can also crowdsource more than just expertise. You can crowdsource problems, solutions, funding, research, implementation, and the key here for government, which we don't do often, is validation. Did said capital infrastructure improvement solve the problem that it set out to solve at the beginning? Do we ever go back and ask that question? Do we ever go back and do retrospective studies? No, not often. On-demand hybrid labor, uh, sites like Upwork, as I mentioned, will continue to be important. Um, adaptive organizational models. I do not encourage agencies just roll out holacracy. There are lots of different ways to be adaptive. The key for agencies here is that they have to look at operating in a state of beta or a state of continuous improvement. 
And so this is something that has to be baked in from the beginning. You'll never reach a point of time where you're done with a project in government. And so this is an example of Wattec deployed holacracy about three years ago. It's being studied by Harvard. I think the first case study comes out this year. But an interesting example of a large technology organization in the state of Washington actually doing something different to challenge the paradigm. And the last is around intelligence, which is about third-party data integration, performance metrics, positive contextual and predictive user experiences, and then government as an API. And the key here, you know, third-party data, government has to find ways to connect different data sets to make it smarter. It cannot generate all the data that it needs itself. And so this is going to be an important play with IoT. How do I leverage other devices that are out there? How do I partner to get that? And I also have to find ways to take my data to where people are. When you go into a restaurant, do any of you look up the county inspection scores for the last food check? No, if you could find it by the time you were at the restaurant, right, you should buy a lottery ticket. So many organizations are starting to look at mashing up that data on Yelp, because you do look at Yelp, or you do look at some of these other third-party experiences. So we have to bring data to people. Performance metrics, you know, the ability to take what we're doing and actually tell constituents, is it good or bad? IoT is going to surface a ton of data. But how do we know if it's good or bad? Well, we have to put it in a form that people can understand. And a spreadsheet is not a form that most people want to deal with in their free time. So performance metrics is key. Contextual experiences, designing government around people. This is also important. This is Gov2Go. It's something used in many states across the country. If you don't own a business, you can customize the experience you have with state government so you don't see stuff about owning a business when you interface with that agency. And that leads us to Government as an experience or government as an API, which is where all of this is heading. When you think about ubiquitous connectivity, you think about internet connected devices, you think about the rise of digital services, how do people access that in the future? It's not going to be how they access it today. And they're increasingly being conditioned by their experiences with private sector companies and user experiences. So what this means is we can start to do really cool things when we connect the dots between these three layers. So this is an example in Louisville where they're doing things with infrastructure, people, and intelligence to connect the dots and create radical experiences. Most cities have gunshot detecting systems, like ShotSpotter. So when that happens, goes into a 911 center, police officers routed by the time the cop gets there, you know, they're gone, there's nothing there. So what they're doing is they're going to test <laughs> sending drones, autonomous drones, to a location that was triangulated by ShotSpotter, starting to record footage, and providing analysis on whether or not someone's there. Right? You might start to see drone, drone chases in the future, but this is an example of connecting the dots between these different layers. When we look at IoT, IoT doesn't manifest itself as just one of these. It really requires the culmination of all three in order to extract business value out of it. So where you come in, government needs help. Right? CIOs have a finite amount of time to keep the lights on with what they're doing now. And you have bright spots of examples like Michael that are doing amazing things, but they still need industry partnership and perspective about how to make sense of this world that we're in. So help them understand the bigger picture, the macro, the micro trends. You want to create opportunities for collaboration around standards. So no one is taking the lead on standards, but someone has to take the lead on standards. And so industry plays a vital role. This isn't VHS and Betamax that we're talking about. This is you know devices that are on mission critical infrastructure. You have to help them build public-private partnerships for innovation. I've not seen truly sustainable innovation in the public sector unless the private sector is also at the table. So you have to help them create opportunities for public-private partnership. And then number four is don't be afraid to do big things. Most people write government off as a bureaucratic mess that can't do anything. But agencies are doing amazing things today. And they need partners to help them accelerate that. We've seen gamification, behavior nudging, all kinds of really radical things that you would never associate with government are now being used by agencies. And so many talented individuals are doing this. So that's really the opportunity for all of us in the room to continue to do. So with that, I think we may have a couple minutes for some questions. But hopefully that gives you a big picture, what I call the fire hose, of what's happening and what we're tracking on. Yes, sir? Oh, sorry. Um, microphone. I was advised to do that earlier. <laughs> So, so first of all, thank you for the uh, the fire hose of examples. Um, I think I learned more in your in your segment about government than I have in the previous five years. Um, I guess the big question I would ask is is around your last point about don't be afraid to try things with government. Um, 
previously I had worked in the public sector, and, and I would say like one of the things that I left with was this feeling that government tends to get in its own way, um, particularly around things like you know the election cycle and, and, and things like budgeting and appropriations and that type of thing. Um, in your estimation, uh, are there some municipalities that, or, or governments, for example, that would exhibit better um, or more compelling uh, markers, if you will, uh, that would allow you to say like, yep, better better uh, place to go, try to drive innovation as opposed to don't spin your wheels. Yeah, that's a great question. So I mean, I think you want to look for organizations that are pushing the envelope with what they're doing today. Like San Francisco is one where, you know, it's very challenging to work with uh, San Francisco in a traditional procurement setting. So they found ways to build bridges to people. And so organizations that are starting to do that, that are operating pilots, that are kind of pushing the envelope, and it's not just siloed as one department, but it's really you know, something that's a, a part of the culture. Like not, you know, Vegas is doing so much, and it's not just Michael, like Michael's leading the charge, but he's working with agencies all over the city of Vegas and public, you know, pi private partnerships to do things. So I'd look for that. Uh, we do a program called the Government Experience Awards, where we evaluate and benchmark agencies that are focusing on experience. And this is outside of just web, but they're focusing on the holistic experience of government. Government is an API. I would kind of use that as a list of the most progressive agencies in the country, and then look at some of the key characteristics there. Uh, but just make sure that it's not you know, one you know, champion that's focused on this. You want to make sure that it's something that it's baked into the culture. And the great thing is culture's changing in the public sector, and so, and they're moving on it. I mean, from a procurement standpoint, the average RFP is on the street 21 days in state and local government. It's crazy, they're moving on change and they're moving fast. Any other questions? Yeah, around, around the uh, open data stuff that you were talking about, I think that's really transformative. Um, however, there's the whole privacy thing. And yes. if you look at Cambridge Analytica, what's going on with Facebook, or I'm sure many of the companies that represent in the room right now are going through GDPR hell right now, uh, trying to meet May 25th. Um, is there, and, and I think about GDPR, if that somehow were to be, you know, the law of the land here, how do you have the, like, right to be forgotten in a context of a, a city? It seems like virtually impossible. Just any thoughts you have around, around data and privacy? Yeah, that's huge. I mean, one of the C's that we've seen is a chief privacy officer starting to become more commonplace, especially in larger agencies as they grapple with what this means. So agencies will have more data on people than they want to have just because of the, the notion of public records requirements. So every interface that someone has, you know, you're required to basically keep it, retain it, archive it, and then dispose of it at a certain period of time. It's super complex, but it also, you know, creates this exhaust of information that is often not actually applied to those different settings. So it's a big problem. I personally think government has to deal with identity first. So right now, identity and identity management in the public sector is a very fragmented area. You've got different proprietary vendors that are controlling and locking up different elements of it. But what if you, as a government agency, created a consortium, maybe it was a permission blockchain, that all agencies actually had some stake in, wasn't owned by any one of them, but actually passed the ability to manage identity and data to people, to the individuals that are there. So we call it an identity data provider. I think you're gonna to start to see some innovation around that. Many agencies are trying to champion that today. But I guess to answer your question in the immediate time, you know, it really requires collaboration, it requires a governance process that's actually not just in a binder, but that is actually executed, automated, and you know, incredibly efficient. Um, industry, you know, has to be at the table for that. And when it comes to the right to be forgotten and, and all of that, you know, that's a challenge. So many legal structures are going to have to be changed with how government manages data from people and the interactions that are associated with it. And so you have the transparency aspect and the need to be transparent that has to be balanced with how much is too much. And ultimately, right now, that comes down to a legal decision or something that's always pushed to the attorney general to issue case law on. But we're going to have to deal with that. I think we have to flip and invert the model of privacy, give users the ability to control and monetize their own data, and let government be a stakeholder at the table to solve it ultimately. It's a great question. Yes, sir. Can you use the term uh, holacracy, which I, that's the first time I've heard of that, so could you uh, explain that a little bit? So Zappos um, was one of the first major organizations to roll out holacracy, so basically, it's a organizational management framework that you eliminate traditional hierarchy structure 
you assign people based on skill and you allow them to evolve in the organization and move based on the needs of the organization. And so holacracy is kind of the proprietary term for that practice and what Zappos did. There's questions on whether or not that was truly effective uh, in the Zappos case and there's questions on the government side as to if this is gonna be something that actually works. I mean, going in and eliminating titles is one thing but creating truly adaptive organizational structures that are autonomous in themselves and departments have autonomy creates uh, you know, a need for major culture change and it has to be set at the top but people have to be bought in at the bottom. So, um, so I think that's one example of many. You've got the lean startup movement, you've got you know, basically all of these things that someone has written a book on and made a lot more money than me, um, <laughs> that organizations are adapting to change but that's really what it is. Government just has to be adaptive. They have to look at the way they operate as a continuous thing. They have to embrace agile in all things. You can't build a bridge with the end in mind, like from the ground to zero. Some things will have to be waterfall <laughs> in the traditional setting, but you have to think, plan, and execute from an agile standpoint and just realize that it's an ongoing process. So you have to be in the business of SaaS, even though we build bridges and roads. I think we have time for one more. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. I'm doing bad at the wait for the microphone thing. Now, I was so impressed by the energy, the excitement you generated, and you are the chief innovation officer in a public sector. How do you have the patience, actually, to be a chief innovation officer <laughs> in a <the> public sector? <laughs> no, a lot, of, co no, lot no, of coffee. No, no, no. Can you give me one example why you should be so excited? Did you really innovate something very fast in the public sector? Yep. So government touches more people than any other industry that's out there. So you are an industry of industries in government, whether it's a social need, whether it's someone that's coming to your city to start a business, whatever it might be, you are basically a microcosm of every industry that's there. And you touch people where they're at. And so government's responsibility isn't just to be complacent and mediocre and do the normal thing, but to actually inspire and create and do better things. Maximize the taxpayer dollar as we say it. So innovation and in, in R&D is actually, it belongs in the public sector. The feds have been doing it for a long time. About oh, about me. <laughs> so, um, what if you do one thing that is so exciting that you return a cost to actually go and work for the public sector? So uh, I crowdsourced grant writing in my city. I couldn't, I didn't want to hire a grant writer because they were too expensive and they were ripping me off. So I decided that someone in my city had to be a grant writer. So I found a way to architect a solution to do that. And I was so inspired by what people were capable of. I was like, these people aren't all gonna come to my council meeting and speak for three minutes against me. Some of them can actually accelerate and help me. And so that was one example where I learned the power of people beyond protesting what I did. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much.